Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm your host, Mira Rubin, and today I am really excited to introduce our guest, Paul Richardson. Paul is a holistic architect, eco-village creator, musician, and new earth visionary. So, Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. That's a mouthful, and I am really excited to share with everybody what a new earth visionary is and all about your eco-village projects and your vision. So welcome. Hi, Mira. Thanks for having me, and thanks for the, um, yes, how to, how to live up to that kind of um, <laughs> You do <advice>. already. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, no, that's... Yeah, it's hard to try and explain something in a few words to people, you know, so you end up sounding quite, uh, I don't know, uh, into oneself, but I'm not really like that. I hope I'm quite humble. More, I just feel very passionate about my mission more than anything. <laughs> well, the truth is that you're someone who's already in action with creating eco-villages and doing some remarkable, remarkable work with alternative building. And um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to just jump in, give us a little bit, just a really short summary of your background so people know where you came from as an architect. Okay, very quick, one minute. Okay, um, <laughs> so I was always into art and creating stuff from being young and sketching and drawing and building things, you know, a lot of a lot of boys are anyway, but, and then I went into the art route through college and uh, then got into like interior design and then mm, and did like a undergraduate degree in spatial design. And then I went and worked out in Malaysia for a while in the late nineties and really got into architecture more then and, and, and kind of started working on, on architectural stuff and went back and did a, another degree, undergraduate degree in architecture in London. And then I had a year out, thought that architecture was not for me. I kind of, you know, just decided that uh, I wanted to do music and, and started to really feel like the commercial side of architecture was not for me. You know, like I was a creative person. I didn't want to be, you know, kind of brought down by this manufactured reality of, of the architectural world. I was into natural materials and, and eco living, going to festivals and this kind of stuff. Anyway, then eventually I came back and finished my postgraduate studies in architecture. In 2002, I graduated and, and moved to the U.S. straight away, actually, and, and worked out there in the Northeast, um, designing, building a lot of residential projects, and mostly, you know, timber frame, porcelain beam, flat pack, high end, lots of, you know, different types, and really got a good understanding of working with people and understanding what you know how people like to live even though i found that a lot of people didn't really know how to manifest that it was more just an idea and then when it actually came down to it they just kind of wanted what was in the magazine so i just you know it started to eke away at me a lot about what is you know what is the home what is really a home and then i went and worked out in uh, azerbaijan and kazakhstan building big uh, kind of skyscraper hotels you know, Marriott, Ritz Carlton, and Regis, uh, some resorts and very exclusive VIP residences for people that you can't really mention. And just, I was just really by that time, uh, I'd say, to end of, you know, 2016 into 2017, I was, you know, spent a lot of time meditating. And I kind of got in a good way with it all and, and could manage the job, could take a lot of responsibility. And, but there was still just, it just wasn't right. You know, it wasn't what my heart was calling me. And then in uh, 2017, I just 
decided I needed to do something. And I went to Peru. I got, I, I heard about this ayahuasca medicine. Some people told me it was, you know, it can help you to find your purpose in life. And I never heard about it actually. And so I looked online and I found this place in Peru. I contacted the guy, he's a shaman who was from Florida actually. He set up a place up there 10 years. And so I went there, had a very difficult time with my own fears and with my own uh, stuff, but, um, you know, kind of got through that and uh, really kind of got clarity again about the love, you know, what I was passionate about and the sustainability and the, and the natural building and the eco, eco technologies and just the idea about creating community. And it was like someone breathed life back into me, you know, and, um, so <laughs> everything changed from then. It was literally like within a month, I left the job. And since then, I've been traveling around the world. And literally every two weeks, I'm in a different country for more than, it's been about 14 months now. And I uh, met Alosha Lin up on the way, who's doing sustainability and off-grid homesteading and um, these practices. And we resonated like, you know, long lost brothers and also some other guys in South Africa when we, from a workshop we went to. And um, since then, it's just been uh, unfolding over this last year. Just, uh, and, and uh, you know, having so much gratitude for, for finding my purpose, actually, because it's so destructive, actually, when we're not on our purpose, especially if you have a strong sense that you have something important to do. And it can be difficult, you know, because you do have that looming understanding that you have something important to do, you know, but then other party is like, <laughs> tell that, you know, that's too much responsibility, you know, go back to sleep. And, you know, it's difficult to step forward into that place of responsibility. You know, I, I to be honest, I never had huge uh, role models in life to, to teach me about that. Actually, it was more the opposite, you know, like not to take responsibility, you know, to, you know, it's, it's not your fault. It's not in your hands. It's not your fault. What can you do? Da, 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 you know, and it's something inside of us, or inside of me anyway, was saying, no, 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 no. that's not, that's not an excuse, <laughs> you know, just because that person thought, Told told you these things doesn't give you an excuse to to act like that. So yeah. Let me just interrupt you for a sec. So yeah. you said this happened in October 2017. I had a very similar experience in November of 2017, and that's where I came up with the my vision for Project Eco Park, and that was where this podcast was birthed from. So it must have been <laughs> in the ethers because. Yeah. Our projects and our visions are very similar. You've taken action by actually creating Haven Earth. And mm. I wanted to talk about Haven Earth and the project that you have been engaged in in Turkey and will lead into some of the other things that you're up to as well. So tell us about Haven Earth. Yeah. Um, well, Haven Earth was, um, it came quite early, actually, the idea uh, Haven Earth came, the name actually came a little bit later. At first, the name that came to me was uh, Mantoa, which is the Mechanics and Tools of Ascension. And the idea that, you know, to, to be able to kind of manifest independent ego communities, sovereign communities that are self-reliant, we needed something to help with that, you know. Because I don't think, as people, we like to be spoon-fed. Or, uh, let's say, we've been spoon-fed too much, and, we, and we're, we're, we're literally sick from it now. And it, it's very obvious. You know, it's time now that we, we eat what we can handle, you know. And um, the idea was that, you know, we can't dictate to people how to create community, but, but we need to somehow create a spark to lift the opportunities um, and let and let people help to manifest these things. So the, the Haven Earth Center is about teaching the technologies that people need to be able to build communities, to be able to build self-reliant homes, natural homes, healthy homes, and um, you know, integrated water, wastewater systems and, and many things like that. And the Haven Earth Center is is literally a, a physical location you know, in the design of that structure would be a, a representation of the natural building techniques coming together. It would also be an opportunity for people to come and build something together. And then from that center, from the, the Haven Earth Center, which now is taking on the name, the Seed Center, actually, to basically, 
you know, kind of start, it would be like a startup for the community. Um, and that would run workshops, would run all of the things necessary to get that community built and set up um, in terms of infrastructure buildings. And we do can do this through workshops. Uh, it allows for a base for these things and they can be interconnected as a kind of central hub of information. And this, you know, this is not like it's a unique thing in some way. I think there's a lot of people, you know, looking to do something like this. And the Haven Earth is obviously Haven, which means a sanctuary. And this, I think we lack, <laughs> you know, in, in, in our homes, our structures. We, we make something of a sanctuary of it if we can, but generally the act of building a home is it's almost destructive in a way. It's a very brutal um, thing. But when we come together with natural building, there's something very loving about it. It's like making a birthday cake, you know. <laughs> Creating a sacred but no, space. You know, it, it's, yeah, you're in it. And it's literally, a, you know, we, we don't talk about it enough, but actually there's something very spiritual and very connecting in actually coming together with all of our differences to, to do something together and create something together, co-creatively. And support each other and fill in the gaps, seeing this person's strengths and that person's strength. And, and and it's like, okay, that was really fun. You know, people come away from two weeks of doing a workshop and um, they're inspired. Yes. Not only, you know, not only to go do that if they haven't even built anything before. Or they're, they're, now they're feeling like, okay, I have some courage and I have some ability now. But, you know, like the, the level of acceptance that happens. And people say yes, you know, like and resonating with this with this kind of divine purpose and mission to to connect to Earth again and live live a more kind of connected life, a more spiritual life, a more centered around uh, relationships and about connecting with each other. And the other things just you know they they fall into their right place. Um, Let me ask you. Um, I know that seed for the SEED Training Center is an acronym, as is CENTER. And I was wondering if you'd, if you'd share what SEED Center stands for, actually. Yeah, well, the center, it's Conscious Exploration of Natural Technologies for Earth, regener Earth Regeneration. I try to keep it as practical in a way as possible, but explaining things, you know, as they are and Seed is stewardship, education, and ecological design. And um, because I think, you know, it's not only about, you know, learning some skills to physically build something, but like we were talking earlier before about, about having them other skills, uh, learning them skills that we don't necessarily get in school or from our parents because they didn't, they didn't learn them things, you know, learn how to understand someone else's point of view or perspective or, or conflict resolution or, you know, there's uh, techniques from releasing their own issues or blocks or, you know, we, <laughs> we're kind of like given very little to be self-reliant actually where it's yeah. not really in the system's best interest for us to be self-reliant. It's better if we're dependent. Let's talk about your project in Turkey. And I just want to okay. let everybody know that there are some phenomenal videos and photographs from this project on Paul's Instagram site for Haven Earth. Maybe you can give us the link for that. And I also want everybody to know that the link will be posted on the Sustainability Now show notes page so that you'll be able to see what some of these extraordinary structures look like. So um, can you give us your Instagram address, Paul? Yeah, Instagram is at Haven Earth Center. And that's Haven, H-A-V-E-N, not, not Heaven. Some people say Heaven Earth. Great. So um, tell us about that project. How did it get started? And I'd love to get into some of the actual building techniques that you're using as we discuss it. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's an interesting project. I, I The gentleman who's landed is and who wanted to do a uh, start a farm a permaculture farm and i met him on a on the rich carlton hotel project in kazakhstan and he told me it was uh, the end of the project it was june 2017 he showed me his land and he says you know i'm going to put this metal prefabricated box in there and i said i'll i will kill you if you do that 
<laughs> and <laughs> although he's a he's a Wing Chun expert, right? I wouldn't have any chance really. But and then anyway, you know, I went on my merry way doing my thing, and um, he was, you know, doing his thing, and then. Eventually, it was a year later, we started building on the land. I went there in April to have a look at the land. And then uh, we made some design. He wanted to build an underground room, like a root cellar. So we did that as a first project. And then, you know, I was I was back and forward because I was working still my corporate job part time, um, like two weeks a month. So I was going back and forward to Cairo or to UK or different things. And then we tried to organize a workshop. This was Haven Earth was just just sprouting at this point. And um, I tr- we tried to organize a workshop, but I didn't even have an Instagram page or anything. I, I was, like it was just some fantasy, you know, that that um, people would come because it, it, we decided to run a workshop. So I had some hard lessons about these kind of things, which was good. And it didn't deter me actually. It just made me, you know, I, I really appreciate the learning and the gaining the wisdom from this experiences and then it was basically he said i said you know what let's do it you know the labor is not so expensive there so we um got some got some labor uh, some of the guys would use before and they really liked to work them with the super adult so um they they came back and helped it was like a family kind of thing it was about eight or, eight or nine people you know, it was int- interesting because I was um, the, the original design was a little bit different, and I had like a 3D model done by some 3D guys in, in Serbia. I had to pay out of my own pocket, you know, like close to two thousand dollars, and did all this stuff and invested my money, and <laughs> and uh, you know, and like, and then and then I went to Russia with a Losha and and like when was it? September last year. And um, everything started to happen with this project in Krasnodar in the south of Russia, a community project. And I had some really interesting, we were like really living healthy, kind of almost like in a spa. And um, I had this fire massage. We both had the fire massage, but um, I had very powerful kind of effects from it. Anyway, then I went back to, to had to leave and go back to UK again the day after. And when I came back to UK, I had a, I had like a huge, I was meditating. Every time I come back to London, I go meditate on Primrose Hill. It's an ancient Druid mound, it's like one, 2,000 years old or something. So it was good energy there. I always get good, good information, good clarity. Anyway, so I came in, I was, it was in the evening, the day I flew in, and uh, I redesigned the whole house, um, sitting on the hill, and I had my flashlight from my phone, I was I just was kind of like all coming, all the details, everything, how it was going to work, all of the systems. And and uh, I told him, I, I says, I've changed the house completely. He's like, I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and lit, I made I made a model out of clay, which was a, like a really interesting experience. I mean, I've made lots of models before, um, but I, I rolled the clay as if it was the actual bags themselves and, and laid them down like the bags and you know, well, just, just, let me let me interrupt you for a second, so, because people don't know what you mean by bag. So, um, okay. how about if you just you to, describe the construction? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the original design was a super adobe, which is the earth bag technique, which has been, which was, um, um, let's say, developed by Nada Kalili, um, who uh, was the founder of Cal Earth Institute, who people probably know of and heard of, and um, don't assume technique, that. Don't assume that. Tell us well, yeah, a bit more. Exactly, but go to, go to color. Uh, it's colorinstitute.com, I think. Um, I know right now they're struggling. They've been slapped with a, a, a closure notice in Hesperia, California, because they don't have a fire road. Um, although they've been, you know, functioning for years and years and years without one, and they're not, you know, they're building with earth, so it's hardly a fire risk. But anyway. Um, so check them out there you know there it's it's a really interesting technique and um it's you know you're using rolls of sandbags essentially that maybe the army use or um you know you're using flood control or something like that and you fill them with a mix of predominantly just basic construction sand which is you know very very cheap and, and always locally mined normally and and then you mix it with a tiny bit of cement. You can make it with just earth, but 
it's it's definitely more temporary and uh, you're relying upon the bags for for the strength but with um with a little bit of a cement about nine eight nine percent of cement you stomp it down you can see we have a little video on youtube and on the on the website you know and you can just see you know it, it, it's it's quite a manual job but it's very fun and you get really fit and you know you by the time you're done with the two weeks you're you're feeling you know like okay let's build the next one and you know, just to fill people in, that's the technique we're using. And then, you know, I made made the little model to be like that, like the rows of bags. And um, the strength of the domes is the circles, they're concentric circles. And in between each layer of bags, you put some barbed wire and it creates this tensile ring um, and also stops the bags from slipping, you know, on top of each other. And then you just, you know, use some compasses. So obviously, if you people know how to use compass to draw a circle, I think, and you just basically use big compasses on the side, and you create some central point to the pole, and then you hook a chain up to that, and you know there's a, a little logic, you know, it, it, you know, but it's not complicated. You don't have to go to engineering school to figure out how to do it. Someone can sit down for half an hour, show you how, and you're like, okay, really? <laughs> so you know, it's it's more just staying on point and and focusing the technique and make sure you follow it as you go and caring about what you do. A lot of people, they just get in a position. They want to get things finished. They want it to be over almost like I feel like in regular construction, <laughs> but um, keep in, it, it's nice because it, it has its own pace, you know? Um, just for f- folks that are listening, you definitely want to go and check out these photographs and videos because the house looks like a bunch of beehives sort of connected to each other, right? Yeah, exactly. There's two, two, one, one main door, which is actually sitting on top of the underground room, which was a circle. And then so we put a floor on top of that, and then we build another, we build a dorm on top of that. So it's actually three levels, the underground, and then we have like a kind of a bedroom, and then there's some little staircase in there which goes up to a little loft bedroom and then there's there's a circular room which is seven and a half meters which um i like in the model you can see as well i use little pieces of sticks and stuff like this and we found this old olive tree that had fallen down when they'd been making a road and so we cut that and we put that in the center of this room and we had we found these reclaimed well we bought them reclaimed cedar logs you know, it was just, you know, the great thing about these techniques is, you know, a regular house, you have all these manufactured corners, you have all these manufactured panels, everything's nice and clean, it has labels on it. It's it Basically, they can tell you where to put the screws, you know, but you're working with nature, you're working with the earth, you're working with the elements, you know, and it's a huge difference. It's a complete contrast. I would go to the site and... As soon as we go to that piece of land, everything disappeared. I swear, everything disappeared. There was nothing there. There was no communication. There was just a little generator if we needed it. We got water delivered twice a week. And um, we built a house, like, in peace, in nature, you know, to be to be able to do this, like, create something together. And they really, these are people without skill. Really, they, you know, just laborers and they, and his sister and this one, and they were like uh, loving it, getting on top. And they were more courageous than I wanted them to be, actually. I was like, okay, <laughs> okay, don't go, you know, come down, be safe, and made sure to make lots of scaffolding and platforms for safety. And, you know, wanted to be professional about how we did it just because we're working with the earth doesn't mean we have to be like throwing it around and a big mud party. But, you know, you pay respect. Of nature, you be with what you're doing. Like you have, um, be grateful that people are being safe, you know. And 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 you know, thank Pacha Mama for for protecting us in our work and what we're doing because she really like the energy is an energy of understanding. Like she's, it feels very supported, you know, when you're working in nature like this. So when you have these homes, they're they're dome shaped, they're circular. Um, I have two questions. One is about the finishing of the walls and uh, interior and exterior. And the other is about, I have way more than two questions. 
I lied. <laughs> so the other is about <laughs> running um, electricity and running plumbing mm. and also designing the interior mm. of a circular space. Mm. I mean, yeah, the, the domes are obviously a little bit different from regular regular walls, which are quite flat and circular as well. So, you, you know, it's not really something you can put wood cladding or something on. You know, mostly we, I mean, what we did on outside, we put a chicken wire and we just kind of nailed it, nailed it around the um, structure. And, um, and then we plastered onto that. We did a lot of testing with natural plaster because there's a lot of clay on that site. So actually one of our, one of our friends, uh, architect, he had done some workshops in natural plasters. So we started doing some tests with that. And then for the interior, we didn't uh, finish the interior yet. Um, he's waiting. He actually needed to just kind of go and start working, taking a lot of time off. And, and uh, you know, obviously he was paying for it out of his own pocket. So I would wish to finish it much quicker, to be honest. But uh, it's, his, it's his home. It's his project at the end. So I just honored that. Uh, and, but actually it's quite good because I'm more now I'm finding out about hemp. Um, and I really want to um, bring hemp into that structure in terms of the interior plastering, and um, because it brings a breathing, a breathable element to the home. And I was in Switzerland just finding out more about natural lime hemp as opposed to hempcrete as a more, more active and more living um, material to use and work with. And yeah, that's like the finishing. I think what we'll do in there is like an earthen floor, and we set it up to do that in the main living room but then in the bedroom it has wooden uh, separation because it, it's more than one level so we'll just he might do um, a wooden floor in there uh, it just depends i guess on his budget you know this is the thing like if i'm making a model and i'm dictating all of the design it's it is different than when you when you do have a client and they have their you know their budget and usually these kind of projects they're not clients with big budgets really you know like <laughs> not the client who's building a 15 million dollar house it's totally different you know you're working with a level of flexibility and just buying whatever for them you know but but this kind of thing it's it's a it's a balance because it's mostly about making somebody else responsible like this is your home you know like where this is supporting you to do this but you need to take responsibility and his mom you know it's because his mom and dad are also going to live there that on this kind of like a homestead and, he, and his mom wants to go and do all the interiors. So I laid out the interior walls on drawings and showed them how to build them. And we were planning to do a, like a little workshop maybe in the springtime so people can come and we'll do all the interior finishes. We'll make the interior walls and we'll do a little bit of ferro cement work on the, on the entrance doorways and things like this on the outside, which we didn't do yet and because rainy season came there. So we put all the windows, had all the windows in. So basically the structure's closed, it's weather tight. We put the outside plaster on, we get a coating of paint, and then we can come back and do the interiors at our own leisure because then it's not affected by the elements outside, which is basically where you want to get to, really. That's your main kind of point if you're building a project, like get it weather tight. Then you, you know, you can kind of step back and take a breath and then and then think about exactly, you know, how to do it from there. What's the plan for electricity generation for that project? Um, he wants to use solar. So, you know, it's it's an investment and that's why he's working now so he can get the funds together. He does have option to bring power from the um, city and he's contemplating it. And, you know, like a lot of people probably would unless they don't have that as an option. But if you do have it as an option, it's not too expensive. It's not a bad idea. Um, to have as a as like a backup, or you know what I mean, like that you you run off you know your solar and everything as much as you can, but you know there's going to be days uh, it might not be you know possible. So um, he's contemplating doing a dual system, um, and he's an automation specialist. So we're going to do um, like uh, uh, like little panels on the wall, like glass panel, and that will be like a sensor controlling the lights. And, um, it, and and so basically what that's nice about that is you don't need to put all of the electricity in the walls. 
because you know regularly your electricity goes to your light switch and then the electricity goes from the light switch to the light so the electricity has got to run through the wall and stop in the wall it's hanging around in there until you open that switch and then let it go to the light so the system that we're planning to put in there it's a digital system so you put a box on the on the main not the power source and then you just bring a data cable to your switches so when you press the switch it just sends a little mess the box and it says turn the light on and sends power to the light so you don't have to have all this electricity in your walls um so this is one thing we're planning because there's a lot of interference with energy and electricity in our walls and these things where we're sleeping and you know the simple thing it's really not that difficult i mean we we planned the plumbing and these things based on the floor plan. So just make sure you have your floor plan well thought out and locate your, you know, your toilet, locate your sinks, these kind of things. So what we did is we just put some drains under the floor and that go outside so we can connect to, you know, whatever we do on the exterior to, to exit the waste, which we're planning to use like a constructed wetlands. So it will be a natural filtration system for the gray water or your shower water or your toilet will be, hopefully will you'll do a composting toilet or do one of these DIY steps you can feed into a leach field, which can be, we can grow a food forest on top of that. So you're using your own waste to actually grow your food. So um, this is, which it's is, going to be off know, the grid for the water system will also be off the grid. Yeah, he has an artesian well and, um, and he actually has a like a spring that runs on the on the property, so he's quite fortunate with water. Like actually, most of the landowners just think he's, you know, unbelievably lucky to find so much water actually because they can't on their land, and um, and that's why we called it Lucky Spring Farm. Wonderful. So, how about if you uh, tell us a little bit about what's happening in Russia, with the eco village in Russia? Sure. It's an interesting project, just you know, not to to give a huge story about it, and um, because it is still in development, and in some ways I don't like to curse something that's in such a tender stage, you know, by by overselling it or something like that. But it definitely has huge potential, and um, and the and the vision of the of the guy who is kind of spearheading it is really a, such a positive vision, you know, it's very much in alignment with what we're talking about, about creating these models of community that are exciting, interesting, you know, full of life, full of creativity and expression, exploration and, and festivals and, and, you know, interesting schooling for the kids, like, you know, school of natural sciences and, and crafts and arts and, and in a way, it, it's kind of like a showcase of how good a community could be, you know, like this very dynamic kind of way to develop the land, you know, bringing people from the outside for workshops, for events, for conferences, and just create like a thriving economy. I think this is one of the big things in the, uh, we learned from our time in Russia, both myself and Alosha, was that the, one of the biggest issues is economics. It's the biggest killer of the whole thing. Like when people are feeling, you know, like they've got some way to earn living, they have some like outlook of like, oh, you know, into the future, this this is going to grow and it's going to be like this. Instead of just like in the future thinking like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> I have to make sure the winter doesn't cost. I can't change the dynamics to, to a more um, um, exploratory angle, you know, and, and we... We started, I mean, it was interesting because when we showed up there, we we didn't expect it at all, actually, Losha and I. We almost didn't go there, and we got invited, and we were going to go, we were planning to go to a bunch of different eco communities around that similar area in Russia. We had it planned out. We were going to spend one day at this place, and we got there, and we had one evening with the guys, and we all sat around, and it was literally a resonance. Like, I see, I was meditating. I could see the energy in the room, and... From all of the people in that room, there was really light consciousness that was connecting us together in the middle of the room. And uh, it was a so palpable experience. And I realized at that moment, it was exactly one year ago since I had my uh, awakening in Peru in the jungle. And and it was like, not, not my awakening, but just, you know, a deep realization of, of my path, let's say. 
not that I'm awakened or something like that. I'm, I'm, it's all a journey, you know. But yeah, it was just really interesting how it all happened and our energy coming in there really sparked something and started a, a wave of energy for him to get designs. And Alosha and I, over Christmas in South Africa, I went over there to his Fire Vader Academy and um, we lived in, his, in the dorms that we built actually earlier in the year and to working every day on the design for this community and this presentation of it and sent it over there. And they were really, you know, kind of blown away. And it was really nice, you know, like uh, Alosha and I coming together and, you know, kind of designing something co- collectively where always it's, you know, it's much more challenging to, <laughs> to work with somebody in a way. But um, we suspended our, our own ego in that way and just worked on it. And it came out really nice. And there's a lot of interest they have, but they, you know, like there's a lot of people coming to and be involved in this. Let me just interrupt you because you keep mentioning Alosha and I just want to give him a little bit of an introduction. And also you've been talking about training that's available or that you guys are Mm -hmm. sharing with people. So I wanted to let people know who Alosha is and what kind of training you can make available. And we'll be able to provide links to that on our website. Yeah, Alosha Linoff. And he set up a place called BioVeda Academy. And you can go, I think it's www.bioveda.co. And let's, um, let's and it, just spell been... that. It's B as in boy, I-O, V as in victory, yep. E-D as in dog, A, dot C-O. Yeah. And we're going to have, yeah, and we'll have links to um, Alosha from our website as well on the show notes page at sustainabilitynow.global. Yeah, the training is as much as, you know, part of this and probably, I think, one of the biggest parts of it, actually, because it's the most dynamic part to bring people together. So, you know, like we have the online training, which Alosha has been working on over the last few years on his own property. So he's been kind of documenting you know, how to get off the grid with uh, your own water systems and and, uh, and hybridizing some other systems. You can check them all out. He has a lot of links and um, some free stuff and some online masterclasses. Well, we're happy to be helping promote and we'll be promotional partners for this. So by engaging with the trainings that Alosha is doing through BioVeda, you'll also be helping to support sustainability mm-hmm. now. Yeah, yeah. And also from the Turkey project, uh, we were documenting every day the process, making small lessons about each step. And, uh, you know, I wrote a whole thing up about the process from, you know, when you're first looking from land, you know, the things you need to look out for and um, step by step um, lessons about how to actually do the physical work, but then also guidance about how to, you know, get materials find sources and um, connect with the labor um, and all of these things just because I've got a you know a lot of experience as a project manager and construction manager on sites building things that um, I get to also help to, to translate this because not everybody knows this you know I, right. it's not necessarily particularly complicated but if you don't understand the basics then uh, it's going to be much more difficult um, so that's you know the plan is to just share as much as we go along we, as we build as we do new projects is to record in a good way and uh, get these things out there to people let's say possible you know that covers covers us to be able to keep doing this work to keep making these projects because they're not big expensive projects that clients are paying you know big fees for you to do services they're quite low key and you know their margins are very small so you have to be very careful and tight with managing, you know, how much materials you buy, when you get it, and, and many other things. You can you can cost yourself a thousand dollars if you forget something and it takes three, four days to order it, and all of a sudden you've got guys who can't do anything, but you have to pay them, or you know, or you have a workshop going on. So we want to put people in the in the right way, you know, so they feel confident to move forward with their projects. And um, so that's that's kind of the whole training training element of you know more about an individual home, how to, you know, kind of get around these things and start creating something that you can afford that's going to get you out of that situation with relying upon the bank, relying upon these systems that are obviously failing us somewhat. And I think people are now starting to really 
look around at their place and think, shit, this is not actually a, a, a benefit to me. This is actually a hindrance to me. There's the whole veil of, of this, our actions have no effects. <laughs> it's like it's being shattered as all of our stuff is coming up for us to see it. You know, uh, the earth's purging all of, our, all of our pollution and all of the toxins that we've been feeding into her um, for however long now. And she's saying, guys, this is your mess. Welcome. Have a look. Is it what you want to do? And I think it's like our last chance, really, to to say, okay, man. Because, you know, if you can't accept that and you can't allow that process to happen, if that stuff coming up and coming out and being released and learning and, and watching from that, if we can't do that, then we just might as well stop even trying, you know, because it, it's fruitless to come up with solutions if we don't uh, think about it holistically, you know. Um, but I think we are. I think there's a, there's a good vibe. There's a lot of people now who are really, really seeming to let down their guard, you know, like, like to, to come together. You know, there's an excitement about this whole thing. And it's just been building, you know, over the last year or so in a really much more dynamic way. And then 2019 just was like a sledgehammer. Um, of energy that came through and just feel like it's pushing this this thing you know more dynamically forward and I think people are really feeling like that because it's becoming more interest is you know it has that that just snowball effect because as more people get interested in it, then they see more people doing it then they think ah oh, that's going to be a successful thing to do even so they start thinking I'm going to get on that I love to do this and I'm going to make a business out of that or I'm going to start considering the things that I that I thought about before, but I just threw away because these were just fantasies and you know, some hippies living in a farm. It's all shifting, you know, it's shifting from that dynamic where it was just crunchy people who, you know, <laughs> smoking and, and taking drugs, you know, this was the best, you know, like uh, the community thing or it was like some cult of... <laughs> it's, it's becoming more yeah, part of the exactly. common conversation, which is a wonderful thing. So, Paul, let oh, me just it, let me just ask you, we've covered a lot of ground and we've covered like revelation, mission, purpose, um, <laughs> alternative living situations, alternative building situations, creating a sustainable life and community. Mm. I just want to ask you if there were one question that I should have asked you that I didn't, what would that be? Um, or how to or how to get on this mission? You so know, what do you say? Um, because, yeah, I, I say that, you know, it's directly going to show up for you in your life if you make this step. You know, I think there's so many people who are waiting for something else to happen first. They want something to happen to like 190,000% tell them that this is the right direction. There's so much kind of confusion around uh, why, the causes, all of these things of what's going on in the world. And I think it's putting people in, a, in this level of uncertainty that even though they know there's something burning in them that's telling them to change their lifestyle, change their life, they can't because it's just too much confusion. And I think the key is, is to just not go there, look at the observable reality and see that it's not functioning. And the one thing that we know for sure is that, you know, we need to make a change here. And whatever the reason for that is that we need to come collectively to understand that we all have a purpose in part of being, being part of this change. It's, yep. it's really not like some handful of people are just going to lead something and, and everybody else is just going to follow and the government you know like a government structure that just gives the people the handout and uh you know everybody's just to you know can thanks or oh, thanks for the eco home and thanks for the the, the energy free energy and, and thanks for the you know this and then go back to to this pol polluted kind of mindset um i, I think, think it, the, the message is to rise to your calling yeah, to fearlessly step into that responsibility because it's. I was running away from it for so long, and yeah. I, I like, I, I feel like I'm getting younger. 
Yeah. Like in the sense of like my excitement about life and about what I'm doing and about feeling purposeful and, you know, just like connecting with people like I never thought even possible in my life. You know, yeah. I grew up in Newcastle, lovely place, lovely people. But, you know, like it's very colloquial and, and, and you know, I was the first to branch out of that and find my path eventually after a lot of destruction in my life from not being on my path. And um, I just hope that I, you know, I'm being be as open as I can on, the, on this journey, as authentic as possible to just say to people, it's okay, man, to be yourself. You're, yes. We're all normal with our own screw ups and our own mess that we've made in life and whatever I, we just got to kind of put it all that aside now like you know it's like you know imagine world war you know people they, they weren't like okay no 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 let's not let's not uh go to the shelters and let's not grow our own food because you think like this and i think like that and they think that no they didn't they just like got on with it because they understood that actually their life depended on it all of their futures depended on it not just you know the the poor person and um, but they understood they were all going to be affected by it it's that kind of alarm bell that we, <laughs> we need now hopefully right. it doesn't need to be so it doesn't need to be so loud but if people keep ignoring it it's going to get louder you know well so uh, the beautiful thing that i see in that well is that first of all we each have a calling and by rising to that calling, we also can create a greater sense of community and a collective success, a collective movement toward a world that works through our individual expression, which is beautiful. Yeah, and and this, I think there's also a lot of things that in the in and on this planet that have been around for a long time, and we can learn a lot from that. We, yeah. you know, it's not like we need to just come at this like you know like oh we're creating everything all over again you know and right it's like i think yeah well there's a tendency when you you know something has caused you a lot of trouble in your life that you want to just abandon all of it and start everything completely new but um there's so much wealth of knowledge and and experience from what we've gone through as a civilization to take some beautiful gems from all of that you know and move forward let me ask you, is, are there any books that you would recommend uh, for people to read that might have been inspirational to you to get you started on your path? Um, on the spiritual path, I think it was more like the, the Celestine Prophecy and these kind of books back in the, back in the 90s. That's a great book. Um, yeah, yeah, that was, I, I got lost a couple of times walking around London reading that book. <laughs> instead of texting you're walking <laughs> while reading <laughs> but um and neil donald Walsh and um, these guys in terms of um just more kind of the connectivity of and the principles of of how we can live together actually because that's what it, they were talk, talking about a lot was how we can commune together but then also books like uh, the one straw revolution and um, which is about kind of like a permaculture book but but more just about a way of thinking about a beingness, actually. What is that? About the, be the one straw revolution. Okay. And um, I can't remember the author's name. Um, That's okay. We'll put it on the website. Yeah, no, it's a good book. Yeah, and there's lots of, like, I mean, mostly, to be honest, the best source for, for natural building and these things that I found is, is online and, and, and looking at just as many examples. For me, as an architect, like I maybe have a slightly different way I go about kind of researching stuff like this. In some ways, uh, it's quite dynamic in the sense that you get a lot of stuff shown to you by other people, I think, you know, who you connect with in the field and stuff like that. Uh, like Jeff Lawton and um, his books on permaculture and Anastasia um, by Vladimir Megre, you probably heard of it, became quite a cult book in uh, in russia but even outside of russia it's grown popularity and that's really just you know getting back to you know how to create truly integrated you know, kind of homesteads in a, in a natural environment <laughs> because you know i think there's lots of things when you just want to go look for for how to build something or inspiration on a building let's say but in terms of the like we're saying, the, the bigger dynamic for community is actually the psychological element of it. 
right. and getting most examples about you know like how we interact and maybe how we did interact previously and maybe there's parts of ourselves that we're not honoring and that's the more intuitive self the more you know the divine feminine that that's in all of us and you know especially i think obviously the women are more connected to it and i think honoring our roles as well our gifts as beings in all respects i think that's a great place to wrap up and just say thank you so much for being with us and I encourage everybody to go to our website at sustainabilitynow.global. Check out the links. We'll have photographs and also links to what Paul and Alosha are doing. And we'll encourage you to uh, comment on our podcast. Please subscribe. Give us a rating and a review. We'd really appreciate it. And I just want to thank all of our listeners. You're the ones that make this happen in the world to take this and run with it. And I want to thank our producer, Scott Billy. And that's it for today. Until next time, I'm Mira Rubin. Live your best life. Love the world around you. And together, we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now, solutions to shape a world that works. Visit sustainabilitynow.global for resources related to today's program. And be sure to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.